Welcome back to the internet. We're here for my number 20 through 11. Keep getting closer to the finish line, which is sad, but also these games just keep getting better, so it's more exciting. It's very melancholy. It's very sweet. <sighs> which brings me to the prevailing theme for my number 20 through number 11s. It's my short and sweet games. These are games with relatively simple mechanics, easy to teach, easy to pick up, quick to play, fun themes. These are my short and sweet games, and I'm excited to share them with you. Sometimes these are games I'll also classify as potato chip games, because for the overwhelming majority of them, you can't play it just once. You play it once, and you're like, that's great. We got to play it again right now. Get out of my way. Terry, we don't want to play five tribes. Just go back to Washington State, and we'll play this game. Anyway, let's fire it up. Okay, my number 20 is Greed. This is something I talked about a little bit last year. It's kind of flew under the radar, I think, for 2014 games. It's designed by Donald X. Vaccarino, more famous for Dominion, of course. It is a fast card drafting game. You can play with a large number of people. Uh, the theme is your gangsters in the 1970s trying to expand your criminal empire. You can do a couple of different things there. You can recruit thugs. You can spread your criminal organization through various enterprises of nefarious means, or you can go on missions to perform hits to get the money you need. Now, my favorite move in this game is you play the one card where it doubles how much money you get, and then you play the insider trading card. Also, I figure insider trading is a victimless crime, but what's not a crime is how great this game is. My number 20, <gasps> Greed. Now, my number 19, we're going to travel from 1970s criminal organization back into a fabled past. A medieval past where we will go to the Medieval Academy. Now, each player plays, takes the role of a squire who wants to outdo the others in training categories to score chivalry points. To achieve this goal, during six turns, the players must wisely draft the cards that are most useful to them and play them at the right time to uh, move up discs on the training tracks. Okay, I'll admit, the discs on the training track, that's pretty abstract. There's not a lot that works there thematically, but that's okay, because you'll be having so much fun playing Medieval Academy, you won't even notice it. I particularly enjoy the, the aspect of winning the lady's favor and using that to inch past your opponents on different tracks where you may be behind. Now, and also, as far as the theme not being particularly strong, although I think the artwork is great and the components are fun, so it Fits the theme pretty well. You could easily reskin this to be Martian Academy or Pirate Academy or any other kind of academy. I will say, though, in terms of naming, I don't know why they didn't call this game Night School. You know, Night with a K. I think that would be a little bit more clever. But that's just me. Still love it. Number 19, Medieval Academy. It is a truth universally acknowledged that any young man in possession of a top 100 list, must by necessity make number 18 something about Pride and Prejudice. And then we come to Marrying Mr. Darcy, one of the greatest games that there is. Travel back to a day and age of wonder and refinement in the time of Jane Austen as you try to marry the Bennett girls off to the best of all possible suitors. I did a segment on this last year, which you can watch here. I'll run some of the footage now. Yeah, this is a great Kickstarter success. There aren't a lot of copies of it floating around there because of that. If you want to find, if you find one, be sure to grab it. Now, the idea is we take them the role of one of the Bennett family girls and we try to outperform one another in learning to be charming, dominating at social events, and winning the most ideal mate. For example, if Elizabeth ends up with Mr. Darcy, you get all the points. Now, there is also a way in this game to shoot the moon where if you don't end up with a husband, you can turn out to be a world-famous author with uh, generations of legacy, kind of like what happened to Miss Austen herself. So this game is fantastic. Thematically perfect. It is both short and sweet. My number 18, Marrying Mr. Darcy. Alrighty, number 17. Now, I believe the most influential game of recent time is King of Tokyo. One of my favorite games to follow King of Tokyo Certainly one of the shortest and one of the sweetest is this one, Three Little Pigs. Now you have these, these pig-themed pink dice that you roll several times to try to get different combinations to build up your house, be it with straw, with wood, or with brick. But beware the wolf. Now the wolf symbols can slow you down, very much like the dynamite in Bang the Dice Game. However, if you get enough wolf symbols, then you can blow another little piggy's house down. So there's kind of a push your luck there, and it can blow up in your face. But if you push it a little bit more, you can get it to blow up in someone else's face. It's also this, this is a series of the Tale and Games, which I've only played this one. If there are others in that series, you know, there's Baba Yaga and the Tortoise of the Hare. If those are good too, let me know. I'll try them out, get them on my next Top 100. 
But for now, we are happy with the three little pigs. All right, number 16. We come to another game by the inimitable Mr. Dr. Herr Professor Dr. Reiner Knizia. And that game is Poison. Now, the idea with Poison is it's really just a math problem, but thematically it's expressed in a fun way with, with cool components. We have these cauldrons in which we are brewing different types of potions. We have the purple potion, the red potion, and the blue potion. And we put cards, ingredients of different values in there, uh, number one, two, five, and seven, I believe. Uh, and when it hits 14, then that potion busts, and whoever busts it has to take all the cards. Complicating this is that whoever gets the most of a certain color of card doesn't count those. This is like a golf game where you want the lowest point total. So if you end the game with zero points, you win. But if you have the most purple cards, right, then you don't count the purple cards. So there's kind of a push your luck element there where you once you start getting purple cards, you want to get all the purple cards. This is why this game, I think, works a little better with more people because the more people you have involved, the less likely someone is to be able to win that. And so the more risk there is in taking cards. Further complicating that, there is a miscellaneous color, the green color, the eponymous poison, where that can go in any of the three different colors of potion. And if you get the poison cards, that's it. You can't, I mean, those are, those will poison you so to speak. Now, very interesting thing, there is no entry on Board Game Geek for Poison. You have to look under its current branding, which is called Friday the 13th. I haven't played that version, but I'm sure it's just as good as this one. <gasps> Poison. So, I've said before that my favorite board game theme is Pirates. I will say that till the day I die. You can't play enough pirate games. I've also said, though, when I talked about Merchants and Marauders earlier, is in terms of a comprehensive, all-inclusive pirate-type experience, that pretty much does it. I think it'd be very hard to outperform that. But a lot of subsequent games, rather than trying to compete with Merchants and Marauders, they take a sliver of the pirate experience and just make that the game and make it really good. And so this is a short and sweet pirate game I think some of you may have heard of, where it takes just a part of it and you play that out. Uh, and you may have heard of it before. It's called Liber... Nope, just kidding. Not Libertalia. It's called Cartagena. Cartagena is a great game where you are pirates on the run, capturing the famous pirate-led jailbreak from the fortress of Cartagena in 1672. And I know what you're saying. Jared, we've all played dozens of games about pirates escaping from jails in the 1670s. But believe me, of all those dozens and dozens of games, this is the best one. So to move a pirate, you need to play a card from your hand with one of six symbols. A dagger, a pirate hat, etc. When you play a card, you move one of your pirates forward to the next matching symbol in the tunnel. But you leapfrog over matching symbols where another pirate already stands. The only way to get more cards, however, is to move backwards. So it's a game of treachery, backstabbing, and trickery, which I would not want to play a pirate game where that weren't an important aspect of the strategy. Would you want to play a pirate game without betrayal? I don't think so. Certainly not me, which is why I named this game my number 15, Cartagena. Travel now with me, if you will, from the city of Cartagena to the city of Jaipur, the exotic Indian trading metropolis of yore and legend, for the game Jaipur where you are trading different commodities to try to become the best salesman, or salesperson, or, or sales gamer, if you will. The game plays in short, quick rounds, and the winner is the person who wins two of them. You compete to collect different commodities of different values, from leather all the way up to rubies. The rarer a commodity is, the more points it's worth. The more of each of them you're able to trade, the more points you'll make on the exchange. But the sooner you sell the commodities, the more they're worth. Except for silver. Just like in real life. Very simple mechanics, but still very involved three-dimensional strategy you need to use against your opponent. And whoever gets the most camels at the end of the round wins five bonus points. That's number 14, Jaipur. Yeah. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Now, number 13. This is a last-minute entry. This was not initially on my top 100 list because I had not played it yet. I'm grateful I was able to, and so I snuck it in here. It actually bumped for sale off of my short and sweet list. And that game is Codenames. Now, Codenames, it's been talked a lot about. It was a game of 2015 on everybody's top 10 list. The idea is it's a spy versus spy where you have two competing agencies, the blue spies and the red spies. It's a great team game where the clue just consists of one word and one number, and that's all your team has to go off of. Now, it would be cool if it had like a Mad Magazine theme at some point with the black spy and the white spy. If it doesn't, that's okay, but it might be cool. You love it. We all love it. Codenames. All right, number 12. So remember when we talked about San Juan versus Puerto Rico and Shadows Over Camelot, the card game versus the main game. 
This is my reverse of that, where I prefer the board game version rather than its antecedent card game, and that is Lost Cities. The Lost Cities of board game is very similar thematically. The idea is you have these different tracks of different colors that you're exploring in the jungle to find these lost cities. And the, the strategy is, how many of these tracks am I going to try to go down? You go down too many, and you'll end up actually losing points because you won't be able to concentrate enough on one. You go down too few, and you won't get enough points at the end of the game. So therein lies the stratagem. Great game, great board game, plays fast. I guess if you look at my short and sweet list, this is the one that is the most involved. Still great game, still fast to play. Easy to, like a potato chip, it's very easy to play it once and then you have to play it again. Lost Cities, the board game. Alrighty, number 11. Both my shortest and my sweetest game. What could it possibly be? What could outperform everything else in this category? Well, I know it's a game that you all love and you like to write letters to it, and that game is Love Letter. Now, we've probably all played this game into the ground. One of the reasons we played it into the ground is because it's so portable. The thing I love about this, you can put it in your pocket and walk onto a plane with it. You can put it in your backpack and take a bullet train to Paris and play the game like six times. Yeah, I know. Remember that time we played it? Now, my favorite version of the game is the standard Princess Annette version, although I also do own the Japanese one have played the Batman one, have not played the Hobbit one. Uh, I also saw this variant someone posted on the internet where they'd rethemed it according to characters from The Office, which seemed pretty clever, so maybe I'll print those off and play with that version at some point. Love Letter, both the shortest and the sweetest game ever. The Nevermind of micro games. Love Letter. Okay, we're down to it. We've come to it. We have nothing left but the top ten. You're thinking, if my short and sweet games are my 11 through 20, then my 10 through 1 will probably all be very more complicated and very involved games. Well, maybe they will and maybe they won't. I will say my number 1 is the most thematically and mechanically complex and involved and engaging and engrossing game of all time. When you see that, you'll ma make sense to you why I have so many lighter games elsewhere on the list, because the number 1 is the most involved game. Which will it be? I can't say, except I already know it. Do you know it? Can you guess it? Put it in the comment section below. Or send me a tweet on Twitter. Or don't. I don't really care. But if you do, I will reply to you. Thanks for your patronage and for watching. And we'll be in touch. And we'll see you in the Wheatleypedia Top 10 of all time.